Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Waterfowl of the Laguna de Santa Rosa and the Pacific Flyway with the Laguna Foundation and Dave Barry. Looks like folks are just joining us. Some of you have probably attended all of the events in the Birding to Beat the Winter Blues series, so you know the drill. We'd love to hear where you're tuning in from today. You can say hello in the chat box, which you can find by hovering your cursor over the bottom of your Zoom screen. We would love to know where you're tuning in from this evening. And if you have a recent bird observation that you'd like to share with the audience, we would love to hear it. Thank you all for being here this evening. It's a lovely rainy evening here in Sonoma County, which feels like an appropriate evening for talking about waterfowl. Thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. Lots of local folks. If you're just joining us, welcome. Welcome to Waterfowl of the Laguna de Santa Rosa and the Pacific Flyway with Dave Barry. Please share where you're tuning in from this evening and any recent bird observations that you've made. I will go ahead and get started with the introduction. So welcome to Waterfowl of the Laguna de Santa Rosa and the Pacific Flyway with Dave Barry and the Laguna Foundation. My name is Allison Titus, and I am the Community Education Manager here at the Laguna Foundation. This is the final event in our Birding to Beat the Winter Blues series, which has highlighted the benefits of bird watching to our mental and physical health during an especially hard year. It's been really wonderful sharing a love of birds with all of you the past couple weeks. If you'd like to share a highlight or something you learned in the chat or a recent bird observation, please feel free to share. My personal highlight of this series was getting to work with all of these wonderful, passionate instructors and connect with fellow bird noticers from across the country and the world. Um, and I wanted to note that these webinars were made possible with support from the County of Sonoma Board of Supervisors Community Investment Program. So thanks to them as well. I will introduce the Laguna Foundation to get started before I hand it off to Dave. So many of you have attended all of Birding to Beat the Winter Blues and have heard about our work. In case you are new, the Laguna Foundation is a nonprofit organization based in Santa Rosa that works to restore, conserve, and inspire public appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands. The Laguna is a wetland and a 22 mile long waterway, as well as an entire watershed, the largest tributary watershed to the Russian River. And the Laguna de Santa Rosa faces important issues that drive our work today. In more modern history, it's gone from being declared as devoid of aquatic life in the 1970s to being designated as a wetland of international importance in 2011 because of the incredible biodiversity found here, especially the waterfowl that we will learn about this evening. So we are dedicated to restoring and conserving this biodiversity and these important species, as well as educating children and adults about wetlands and nature through our school programs like Learning Laguna, and our summer camp, Camp Thule, which is pictured here, and our public programs like these. Thank you for being in our engaged community of supporters. And my sincere gratitude goes out to those of you that donated upon registering for these programs. Your support is keeping these virtual nature programs accessible at very little to no cost, and therefore increasing our collective knowledge and appreciation of the Laguna de Santa Rosa. So thank you all out there. I really appreciate the support. And if you didn't donate, but you have the means and you would like to at this time, I will include that link in the follow-up email. I wanted to highlight our next free webinar series coming this spring, Early Career Conservationists of Sonoma County. We will hear from We'll hear about environmental career paths from early career professionals and the mentors that support them. 
This series features some incredible local leaders that do a variety of inspiring work. And it's also great information if you're looking to enter into the environmental and conservation field. I will drop the link to that in the chat here in just a minute, or you can sign up by going to our website. And finally, I'd like to remind you to please add your questions as we go along through the webinar in the chat box and also say hello if you've just joined us while I've been giving my spiel to get us started. We will have some time hopefully at the end for questions, but we will also try and take questions as we go along. So I'll be watching the chat box. Feel free to add in your questions um, and we'll try to get to them where it makes sense throughout the program. And finally, also, please be patient with us in the technology today, as usual. Um, if you experience any delays, just know that we will navigate that as best as possible. And you can always ask for clarification on something in the chat, and I'll do my best to help. So I think that is it. It's fun to see all of your nature notes come in. Thank you so much for sharing about the birds you're seeing. Um, Love to, uh, yeah, there's so much wonderful notes in here, the bird feeder notes. Thank you all for putting those in the chat. We are so fortunate to have local naturalist Dave Barry here with us for his Zoom debut. Dave usually gives a super popular waterfowl walk with us every winter, but graciously agreed to try out this whole Zoom thing to bring this information to you waterfowl enthusiasts in your home. Dave is a certified California naturalist, um, and he brings a lot of experience and knowledge of birding and nature to his volunteer work, mentoring young birders, leading bird tours and nature hikes, and giving natural history talks like this one. He is from Santa Rosa, and he has done programs with lots of different environmental organizations in Sonoma County, like ours, but also Sonoma Land Trust, Land Paths, Sonoma County Ag and Open, and the Wildlands Conservancy. And he is a lead naturalist with West County Hawk Watch. And for those of you who attended the um, Breaking into Birdwatching webinar, he works there with Miles and Teresa as well. So we have a super connected bird watching community here. Um, Dave, thank you so much for being here this evening. I'm really looking forward to this presentation and I will hand it off to you to get started. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming in on this rainy night. Perfect night to talk about waterfowl. So let's get started. Let's talk about waterfowl on a rainy night. So we're going to do a little introduction to the Pacific Flyway, Sonoma County, and identification, like beginning base. We're not, definitely not going to get advanced because that's way too difficult in this kind of a format. So let's just start off, since this is a talk on waterfowl, what are waterfowl? And it's um, sounds like an easy question, but it's a lot of times really confused or confusing for people. So we're going to break it down really simply. Waterfowl are ducks, geese, and swans of the world, and nobody else. It's just those three um, groups of birds that make up waterfowl. And three of their physical features that they all have, they all share are web feet a duck bill and a complete wing molt. And that latter one, the complete wing molt, is probably the most important that sets them apart from a lot of other birds. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So here's often how they break down ducks into little different groups. Dabbling ducks, you get 10 species. Diving ducks, sea ducks, like the eiders and scoters. Um, Stiff-tailed ducks, and then the whistling ducks, which we don't usually get around here. So we'll just jump right into the dabbling or puddle ducks, and the most common of all those, and really probably the most common duck in all of um, planet Earth, is the mallard. This is a mallard drake feeding, and we'll talk more about the physical features of the drakes today, since it's, you know, we don't want to get too advanced. So mallards are the most numerous, most common, most widespread, and most um, generalized of all of North America's waterfowl ducks. Um, they go from Alaska to Mexico, and they've been introduced to places like Australia where they're considered an invasive species. 
They're just a really um, successful generalist and really good at adaptation, at least adapting to different um, physical environments. So you notice those curly tail feathers in the black that, with the white below them. That kind of lets you know it's an adult mature drake. So that's another drake mallard with the curly tail feathers, but it's got a purple head instead of the typical green head. And that's because it's changed its angle with the sunlight. And so the iridescence of the head feathers have shown through and kind of changed it to a purple. But it's still a mallard. And if it was to move like a half an inch, it'd be back to being green. So here is a female or a hen mallard. And she's a lot different looking. And we'll talk about why she's a lot different looking. But she's more of just a cryptic, kind of a dull brown. She has a nice blue speculum, the wing bar feathers. So on a duck's wing, they have what is referred to as a speculum and it's usually a color. And hers is kind of a violet bordered by some black and some white. Um, so this is a Drake gadwall and they're also a large duck like a mallard, similar size. And it's a dabbler duck and they feed by you know dabbling in shallow water they have a couple different feeding strategies, and we'll show you some of that later on in the slide presentation. Here's a pair of gadwall, the drakes on the left and the hen or females on the right, and they both have a white speculum. But once again, she's more of a cryptic brown, kind of a mottled brown. The drake is a kind of a gray, really, um, it's a subtle, feather pattern that they have. And if you're up close to them, especially if it's clear, they're really, it's a, like an intricate pattern all over their whole body really. But from far away, it just looks like this dull gray, really a pretty bird up close. This is a drake, but not a mallard. This is a drake northern shoveler or often called spoonies because they have a really oversized bill. And we'll see some of that later. Um, they're a smaller kind of duck, maybe medium sized in North America. And they're also really increasing in population. Their numbers are going up pretty dramatically. And it's because they're a generalist and kind of like a mallard. And they're really just starting to spread out and become much more popular around here. You can see the good place to see these are at Kelly Pond, right along the Laguna Trail in between Occidental Road and Highway 12. But they're also, they're widespread. You can see them at Schollenberger Park in Petaluma. And then once again, here's another hen or female and she's brown, kind of cryptic mottled brown. And that's all gonna be for a reason that we'll get to. You can see that really large oversized bill. Another picture of a drake. And they're just, they're a really pretty bird. See that really big, spoonbill of theirs. There's one flying. As you can tell, I think it's a pretty bird. Little flock. So now we get into some of the smaller ducks and they're still dabblers, still puddle ducks. Cinnamon teal, and you could probably tell that by the color of the drakes. But you could also see there's three females in the back and they're once again, just kind of a brown mottled color. Another pair. And a good place, there are cinnamon till along the Laguna de Santa Rosa. Um, a couple places you could see them. You might look out if you walked along the trail going west from Stony Point Road, or you can see these at Ellis Creek and Schollerberger Park. They're uh, also in the Sonoma Napa Marshes around Sonoma County, all part of the Pacific Flyway. So the Pacific Flyway, it stretches from Alaska to Mexico, and pretty much the entire state of California encompasses it as it goes north to south down to Mexico. You can see all the dabbling ducks like to get in the shallow waters and they'll go right into the right up on the land actually but they like the shallow waters and they'll strain for 
aquatic macroinvertebrates, snails. Here's a pair of green wing teal, which are much more common. You see a lot more of these around. And another place you could see these is Kelly Pond along the Highway 12 Laguna Trail. And all the teal have either a green or kind of a turquoise blue wing speculum. And you can see the hens speculums being shown right there. There's another drake. So there's an imposter behind them. That's not a waterfowl. That's an American coot. But they're, you know, oftentimes in the same habitat. And then here's kind of a special guy. This is a blue winged teal. And you don't see a lot of these in Sonoma County. You can once in a while. Um, you see more of them up towards Humboldt Bay. Uh, once again, it's another teal. And you can just see the blue speculum kind of on the wing, not very well in this photo. So now we got into a different duck here. This is an American widgeon, and they're fairly common, um, especially coastally and along bays. You can find them all around Tamales Bay. Um, you do also see these along the Laguna de Santa Rosa and Kelly Pond along the Laguna Trail. And they're usually in a pretty good sized flock. They're kind of a flocking duck. All ducks are, but these guys really are kind of social. So that's the male in front of us. He has the white forehead with the green kind of eye stripe going back towards his neck. And then the female is behind him. She's kind of a brown or gray. And we also have in this slide, up at the right-hand corner, that's a Drake Eurasian widgeon. And they're, um, so they're not a native species. They don't really breed here, but they're becoming more and more common and we're starting to see more and more of them each winter. Um, no one's really quite sure why, um, but we are definitely getting more of them coming down. And this was photographed, this one happened to be photographed at Lake Sonoma. That's a better view of him. Dave, I had a quick question. This is just my question. Um, could you point out again the difference between the American and European widgeon? Yeah, Eurasian. Eurasian, thank so, you. So the, in this slide, so the Eurasian widgeon is in the back right corner. Gotcha. And he's kind of gray, brown. He has a white forehead, blue and black bill. And then he has like a red eye stripe that goes from his eye back towards the back of his neck. And so in the foreground of the photo, there's a male American widgeon. And so they have the same color bill, really the same body styles and colors, except their heads are different. So the American widgeon has more of the white head with the green eye stripe going back towards the back of his neck. And the Eurasian widgeon has the red stripe going back. And that's Great. really the only striking difference. Thank you. You're welcome. So this, if you look in the center of the photo, the bird in the water, so that's a male American widgeon, but it's also referred to as a snow widgeon. And that's because it has the, its whole head is basically white, but then with a really bright green um, eye stripe that goes back towards its neck. And you don't see a lot of those. This one I got lucky and happened to see at um, Schollenberger Park, but there's just not a lot of them. They're just every once in a while, a variant comes out and they have a really white head, really stark white. And you can kind of see the difference because there's another male in the photo on the sandbar and it's, you know, not as white. And when you see it in person, it's like really white looking. So this is a flock of American widgeon. And the reason why I wanted to show this to everybody. So American widgeon, of all the North American ducks are the most goose-like. So what I mean by that is their diet consists about 75% vegetarian. So as you can see these guys, this flock, they're out in a field grazing just like cows or sheep would, or just like geese would. And that's what they like to do. They're a large percentage of their diet is vegetable matter. So here we're going into uh, 
northern pintail. And these are pretty um, easily identified. They have a lot longer body than all the other ducks. They're really angular, long, kind of um, aerodynamic, if you will. And even when they're in the air in flight, they're very pointed and their wings kind of point back. And they're just a kind of a long angular duck. But I was gonna show, so we call them dabbling ducks or puddle ducks. And so this whole group of ducks, that's what they are. And this guy, we're gonna demonstrate like part of their feeding strategies and why they're called dabbling ducks. So they dabble. So the length of their neck determines how far down they can reach vegetation. And they just tilt their bodies up, kick their legs or feet, that big web foot, and keep their body in that position and they feed. So he's stretching his neck down to the bottom or wherever the vegetation is and pulling up submerged aquatic vegetation. And here he comes up dripping water. So we'll play a video here. One sec. Assistant. Yeah. <laughs> I might have done it. Let's see. So we'll talk about what we just saw for a little bit. So it's a dabbling duck and it's a hen mallard and she was in some shallows and you can see the little red plants that were in there. That's the world's smallest fern, that's a Zola. And she was just in the um, marsh in the shallows feeding. And then you could see at one point she pulled up a snail and she kind of munched the snail. So they're just looking for um, submerged aquatic vegetation, plants that they like to eat. And then they'll pick up, you know, um, macro aquatic invertebrates or they'll get you know snails and things like that and supplement their diet. We have some mallard questions Dave that have come in. Okay. Um, so first of all you mentioned that mallards are the most generalized. Um, what do you mean by most generalized species? Well they don't require like an exact habitat type. So they're really good at adapting to different types of habitats. Um, so can, so the hens like um, are really good at breeding. They don't need like perfect conditions. Um, conversely, pintail females, they are super duper picky and need exact parameters to set up their nests or else they won't breed. Mm. So mallards are, we kind of think of them as generalists because they're just not picky and if there's water and feed, they'll be happy. Got it, I see. So they're generalists in their diet, they're generalists in their nesting, kind of generalists in all sense of the term. Yes. Um, which is- And then there was another question, which is, do ducks tend to hang out in the same area until they, if, you know, until they migrate or like resident ducks, do they, generally hang out in the same pond? Interesting. Um, so they do get their favorite places, but it depends on if the food's gonna stay there and keep them there. Or, you know, if there's a lot of predators around, if there's not, if there's not something there to move them away, they'll stay. If they're not, you know, disturbed, if there's not a lot of people bothering them or dogs or raccoons, and the food source is there and there's water so they can rest because they like to sleep in water. If all that's there, then they have no reason to leave. But you know, if they're disturbed, they'll fly around until they find a better place. Gotcha. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Next video. This seems quite good. So before we start this one, this was actually filmed at Kelly Pond. Um, 
and it's um it's kind of hit and miss sometimes the shovelers are there a lot and sometimes they're not but these guys were putting on a pretty good show Okay, so in that video, we saw, actually, we saw like three different behaviors. So we saw two feeding behaviors. So the main focus was on a, a really unique feeding strategy for northern shovelers. So they like to spin around like that, creating a vortex. And what it does is it creates an upwelling in the water, and it lifts up zooplankton and little micro. Um, you know, microbes and little crustaceans that are down deeper than they can reach. And it brings those up to where they can feed. And then they use that oversized bill of theirs um, as like a filter, almost like a baleen well would use. And they filter out the water and get all that little zooplankton and little aquatic life that's in there. And that's one of their really unique feeding strategies. Then in the back of the video, you could see there was another pair of northern shovelers that was doing the really typical um, dabble feeding where they just tip upside down and their butt sticking up in the air and their necks down stretched out to get food. So that was the group of puddle and um, dabbling ducks. Now we'll get into the diving ducks. So one of the separators that separates diving ducks from the puddle ducks is a physiological feature. So diving ducks, their feet are actually, and their legs are set back at the very back third of their body um, compared to the puddle ducks where their feet and legs come out basically kind of in the middle of their body. So the differences are Puddle ducks can come out on land and they can walk really good. Like the widgeon, they go through fields and graze like sheep. But diving ducks, they're very clumsy out of water. They don't like to even, most of them don't really come out of the water very often. Certainly won't walk very far from water. But the other unique thing is their flight. So puddle ducks, they can jump straight up right out of a little puddle and be in flight. Diving ducks have to get a running start. And there's one exception to that rule, but so think about that. All of the North American diving ducks, they all have to get a running start with the exception of one. And it does get a running start, but it can also under duress, just take off like a puddle duck. So this is um, a canvas back male. And you see thousands of these along the Highway 37 corridor, the Sonoma Napa marshes. You can see these at Schollenberger and Ellis Creek, and it's a good um, San Francisco Bay duck. It's kind of a bay coastal duck, and it's also the fastest flying duck in North America. And they're they're good size. They're big. They're as big as a mallard, maybe a little heavier. So another thing about diving ducks is they tend to um, definitely stick with their own you know, species in their own little flocks, but their flocks will get intermingled with other diving ducks. So in this picture, you can see there's a big male canvas back in the front, and then behind him is a little ready duck male, another diving duck, but much smaller. But they all kind of hang out together. So these are um, greater scalp. San, Fr San Francisco Bay was one of the largest scalp winter grounds on the entire Pacific Flyway. Um, it's gone down a little bit 
but it's still, um, you could see, still see rafts of thousands of these out in San Francisco Bay. Not easy to detect them all from shore. Sometimes you have to be out there in a boat. And especially sometimes when there's big storms coming in, you'll see more of them gather up closer to um, shore. They have a kind of a greenish head with a blue bill, and that's one of their nicknames is a blue bill. And they have a smaller cousin called a lesser scalp. And then they're also related to the ring neck duck. Speaking of ring neck ducks, here's a male and a female ring neck duck on the right. The male's on the right, the female's in the center with her head kind of back to us. And then there's a couple ruddy ducks in there too. But the ring neck duck, the drake, they're just a really beautiful duck. So the only problem is their ring neck is really difficult to see. And you can't even see it in this photo because he has his neck scrunched down. If he had straightened out his neck and stretched it out, kind of right at the base where the purple fades into black is actually kind of a maroon ring that goes all the way around his neck, but they don't reveal it a lot. And they have a really neat looking bill too. And that's a female. So here's a, these, this is a pair of hooded mergansers, and there's three mergansers that we pretty much get in North America. And then this one, hooded mergansers. And then we get common mergansers and red-breasted mergansers, and they're all fish eaters. So they have these long kind of serrated bills, and they, you know, they're, they're divers, so they'll dive underwater and catch fish. And these hooded mergansers, one of their favorites is crawdads. They really are fond of catching crawdads or crayfish, however you like to say it. This is their bigger cousin, the common merganser, really big ducks, and the males on the right. So they're really kind of easy to identify. They have this big black head, really bright red bill, kind of long serrated, and then they have a really white looking body. And they really stick out, that black and white pattern sticks out. Pretty easy to notice. Really good divers, and these guys, they can eat big fish. I mean, like a 12 inch trout, no problem. That's a female. So this is a really common duck in wintertime here in Sonoma County this is a male bufflehead. And you could pretty much see these almost in any body of water. Um, the estuary out in Jenner, along the Laguna de Santa Rosa, Petaluma River, all over the place. Spring Lake, Spring Lake has a lot of them. Speaking of Spring Lake, you can see a lot of different variety of ducks there. If you're local, if you're from Sonoma County, good place in the winter time to go look at ducks. Flock of uh, buffleheads with a uh, ready duck, a female on the right or excuse me, on the left side in the front. So these guys are some of my favorites. This is a common golden eye. You could see that bright gold eye with that green iridescent head, white cheek patch, really black and white body. So these are inland mountain lakes and stream breeders. And then they come down in the winter time and you could see them on small ponds probably like a winery pond and um, bays that you can, I mean, they're kind of widespread where you can find them. But one neat thing is they're called whistlers. So when they fly, their wings actually create a whistle sound. So if you're out like in um, Jenner and you on the, along the river, maybe you're kayaking and you hear a whistle, kind of look around and you'll see these ducks flying by pretty fast and their wings create a whistle. So we'll get into why mallards and all these ducks that we've looked at so far, the males and the females are so much different looking. So sexual dimorphism, that's what causes that. And you can see the slides so you can read it. I won't read it to you. 
oops, so let's go back. So what does that sexual dimorphism do for, sorry, a male and a female duck? So the males are out there during courtship and they're brightly colored and they're displaying their colors, you know, and they're trying to win the attention of a female to breed. So they were successful. They get to breed with a female. She picks them out. But she doesn't want to be brightly colored because she's going to go nest on land somewhere. Not, you know, in a tree like with a nest, you know, where like your robin or something would. But they're going to nest on the ground, usually in grasses. So they're really susceptible to predation, nest predation. So if you were brightly colored, you would stick out and, you know, you might lay one or two eggs and then you'd get eaten. So if you're cryptically brown and mottled with blacks, browns and grays, you have a lot better chance of blending in with the vegetation you're going to select to make your nest in. And then so then you're giving that nest a lot higher percentage of actually brooding out and making little ducklings. So it's a pretty clever scheme and it works really good for all the ducks in North America. But we move into the geese. Then you notice geese, the males and the females, the ganders, they all are the same. Like you look at them, there's no physical coloration difference between a male and a female goose. They look exactly the same. So this lends to their breeding strategies. So geese typically, especially if you're talking about like snow geese and greater white fronted geese, up in the Arctic tundra, they're breeding right out in the open. So it'll be a flock of like a thousand or 5,000, 10,000 geese just breeding right out in the open. So your whole concept is to blend in and not stick out. You don't want anybody to notice you. You want to look just like your neighbor. Because if you stick out a little bit, if you look a little bit abnormal compared to everyone else, that Arctic fox or those wolves or that jeer falcon or that snowy owl is going to notice there's something odd that sticks out about you. And then it's going to make it easier for them to key on you and predate you. So geese and ducks, all waterfowl, but they have different physiological differences and they um, have coincide with their breeding strategies. So this is a Canada goose and they're widespread. There's, I think, five different subspecies of Canada geese and then four different subspecies of cackling geese, which are the really small ones. Um, but this Canada goose, these Canada geese are the ones that are widespread all over now. Um, they don't even like the ones around here, they don't even migrate. They just you know, go to a golf course, go to um, a winery pond, spring lake, any kind of pond like that. And you'll find a flock of geese and they just live here year round now. All their um, needs are met here. So they've altered their migration and that's all due to human activity. Um, agricultural practices have altered um, goose migration quite a bit. Canada geese flying. And these were all shot along the Laguna de Santa Rosa. So this is one of my favorite geese. These are um, greater white fronted geese as I almost had a moment there. So they're called white fronted geese because of the white area right where the base of their bill connects to their face. And you can see it kind of extend like up by their eye, but it goes very um, vertical, just an up and down stripe on their face. So that's how they got their name, greater white fronted geese. And um, they are found coastally in the wintertime along the Sonoma coast, not in any large numbers, but you do see them um, sometimes in the Russian River estuary around Jenner and Penny Island and other places coastally like that. But they're found in great, great numbers in the Sacramento Valley. So these are Brant, and you can find a lot of these, hundreds if not thousands of these, depending on the year, in Bodega Bay and Tomales Bay. Um, so these are Pacific Black Brant. 
they breed up in the Aleutians of Alaska. So these are kind of the Olympic athlete of the waterfowl world, at least one of them. Um, these geese, and they're small, they're not really much bigger than a mallard duck, a little bit bigger. But these guys will fly 3,000 miles over open ocean water in about 72 hours from the Aleutian chain to Sonoma County or, you know, places further south that go San Luis Obispo, Morro Bay, all up and down the California, Washington coast and Oregon coast. Uh, very coastal goose, you don't find them inland, but you could find them like Doran Park, Campbell Cove, Bodega Bay, and they're really neat looking. They like to, um, they predominantly feed on eelgrass, so they're really selective in what they eat. You can see they're kind of smallish, even her bill small. They're, I don't know, I've always found an attraction to them. So I lucked out one day when I was out in Campbell Cove and Bodega Bay and found these, well, there's a whole flock of um, brant, but three of these you can see all have band, leg bands on them. So it just happened to be a lucky day. And that's because, so why are birds banded? Good question. So they're banded for research. So researchers want to find out what's taking place with waterfowl. What are their migratory habits? Are their migratory habits changing? Are they flying farther? Are they flying less? Are they um, flying earlier in the season, later in the season? Kind of tracking all of that data to see what these birds are doing. Um, where do they winter? Are their wintering grounds protected? So if you're gonna do conservation with waterfowl, you often have to be international. You have to work in Canada, you have to work in the United States, you have to work in Mexico because the birds are traveling and they don't recognize borders. So one of these banded birds, well, this flock was, I can't even barely pronounce it, was actually hatched in Nisquit, North Slope Borough of Alaska. So way up there. And it wasn't me. So there's some questions coming in, Dave, um, that I wanted to highlight while we're talking about Bodega Bay. Someone asked, would loons and grebes not be considered waterfowl? And there was a question earlier about so what makes waterfowl? What are what about these other birds like coots and grebes? What are they? <laughs> so coots. Um, well, so okay, so coots and grebes are no, not waterfowl, because they don't have web feet. Ah, coots, of course. Uh, and if you ever seen a close up of a coots feet, so coots are in the rail family, I believe. I, I'm probably goofing that up, but I think they are in the rails with the rails. Um, but they have webbed toes. So if you ever looked at a coot's feet, it's really fascinating. It's kind of a bright green and it has these really weird patterns on it. But then each toe is individually webbed rather than having um, an entire foot webbed. Um, and then they just, they're just, yeah. So the other thing I talked about earlier, probably the most important feature that separates ducks and geese and swans of the world was the complete wing molt. So I should get into that because that's like the most important part. So what's meant by complete wing molt? So swans, geese, and ducks all lose all of their flight feathers all at the same time. So if you're, and by all, it's like 90%. It's not like every single one. But so what actually happens is they lose their ability to fly, unlike almost all other birds. So most birds have a different type of molt, they lose synchronicity where they have a, a synchronized molt where they'll lose like the number one primary flight feather on each wing at the same time and then replace that. And then a number two flight feather will molt out on each wing at the same time. So they're synchronized and then that one will grow back in. So they never lose their ability to fly. Waterfowl, they lose all of their wing feathers at the same time, their primary flight feathers. So they lose their ability to fly. So they're susceptible to predation. It's a big, big um, energy drain also. So it takes a lot more energy to grow back all of your flight feathers all at the same time as compared to growing back one or two wing feathers, you know, randomly, it's not really randomly, but at a time. So, 
but they've strategized it really incredibly. So they do it right after their brood has hatched and their little ducklings are swimming around and they can't fly either. And as the ducklings are maturing and they start replacing their down and getting their feathers and then all of a sudden the ducklings are gaining their flight feathers. Well, that's the same time that their parents are growing back their flight feathers. So that by fall, they all have a brand new set of flight feathers. And it's really an uh, ingenious plan because then as soon as fall comes, ducks and geese and swans are gonna start a really arduous, long mile, harsh condition migration. So they're going 3000 miles or farther. And usually they live in harsh conditions, you know, up north. I mean, obviously we have birds that live here, the geese and ducks that live here. So they don't have it as harsh, but the ones it's designed for the guys that have the harshest conditions. So they've replaced all of their flight feathers so that they have this brand new, healthy, perfect set of flight feathers so they can make that long arduous migration under the best conditions. And they were flightless when their little babies were flightless. It's a good timing. Amazing. Yeah. It's a grand design. Exactly. Um, well, thank you for expanding on that. And folks were also interested, sorry to interrupt about the certificate. There was someone who asked about where to report um, if you so see a banded you, bird. So if you could expand on that a little, okay. that would be great. If you get any band in like one of your pictures and it's readable or readable, you can turn it in, you can go online to the U United States Geological Survey Service and you can report that band They'll have a whole form on the website for you to fill out with the most detailed information you could fill in the better. And then if they're able to decipher it and they get the information they need, they'll send you back a certificate like this. And it'll tell you where the bird was banded. Oftentimes it tells you who banded it. As you can see this one was banded by a US Geological Service bird bander. And his name was John Pierce. And he's working for the Alaska Science Center. So, Pretty much anywhere you go, if you see a band in one of your photos, turn it into the USGS and you might get lucky and find out where that bird came from. Another brant. So now we're gonna go back into some ducks. So these are the perching ducks. And we only have one perching duck in North America that I, yeah, I think. And so that's the wood duck, really iconic duck. A lot of people think of this as the, I don't know, most beautiful or prettiest duck. I'm not gonna argue with you. Um, I don't know if I can narrow it down. That's my whole problem. I really like blue wing teal too. And cinnamon teal aren't too shabby either. But yeah, these, these ducks are definitely beautiful. This is a male. So what's interesting about these ducks is they're perching ducks. They're really um, fond of trees. They're really good at climbing trees. They have strong toes, they have strong toenails, um, but they rely on woodpeckers because somebody's got to make that hole in that tree that this duck could climb into and make their uh, nest. And I don't know, if you're a duck fan, you've probably seen a video somewhere of when the little wood ducks hatch and then they're in the nest. And then like in day one, they jump out and they're, you know, completely just this little down ball and they have no feathers, they can't really fly. Well, they can't fly at all. But it's unique in that when they jump out, they position their body so it's just like they were flying. Like they're usually, you know, head up and feet down and they're flapping their wings and they look like they're flying, even though they're just falling straight down to the ground. So hopefully, if you're a wood duck and you pick the old woodpecker nest, you're inside a forest. So hopefully that forest floor is full of a bunch of leaf litter. So when that little duckling hits, they're kind of um, really um, bouncy, really um, their bones aren't hard. They're still really soft and flexible. And then they hit that duff on the forest floor, all the leaf litter, and then hopefully they'll bounce. Well, and they do. And then they all kind of get their senses and walk to the nearest body of water. There's a female in the front. Drake in the back, whole flock of them. And we do have, um, I don't know, I want to quantify, but we do have 
a pretty decent population of wood ducks in Sonoma County, and we do have breeding wood ducks in Sonoma County. Um, but wood ducks were definitely in trouble um, because we have bad, um, well, bad forest product, um, practices, and then we don't take care of riparian corridors. So a riparian corridor, so that's a corridor um, around a body of water, riparian corridor, you know, rivers, creeks, and even you can have a riparian corridor around a lake, but it's that vegetative growth that grows pretty dense, usually with an understory and an overstory near a waterway. And we don't like those. We tend to think that's too much land, so we use it for something else. So when we were getting rid of all those trees and all those riparian corridors, well, we got rid of all the breeding habitat for wood ducks. So that's what spurred a lot of youth organizations to start wood duck nest box building. And so a lot of scout troops and stuff like that will make and put up wood duck nest boxes. And so that actually has been really successful. Thank goodness that wood ducks don't mind our man-made boxes and actually like utilizing them. So a good place to see wood ducks in our region here in Sonoma County is um, anywhere from mid to lower Russian River, like around Monterio, Duncan Mills. They're actually out there, they're breeding, even in places in Austin Creek. That doesn't mean you're gonna see them all the time, but they're there. And they're actually in the Laguna de Santa Rosa. The problem with that is where they are, it's really overgrown. And as with most of the Laguna de Santa Rosa, um, a lot of it lies in private property, so it's not easily accessed. But it, even if you go to the public places, if you're quiet and you pay attention and you're looking, you can find them. But as with all ducks, ducks tend to be kind of um, squeamish around people. They're a prey species, so they're used to being preyed on by all kinds of different predators, including humans. So they tend to move away from you when they see you. Wood ducks with the sun. Wood duck on a tree. So this guy, not one of our local ducks, not one of our birds we expect to see, but it was a free ranging flying um, black bellied whistling duck. And this one showed up about five years ago in um, Lake Ralphine and it stayed like quite a while, a couple months. And it would also be seen in Roberts Lake and Roanoke Park. So it was, it was free flying duck. Um, I surmised it was probably an escapee because it had a few marks on its wings that made it look like it probably had been maybe in a pen, maybe it was someone's um, collection. But anyways, this guy got loose and he was flying around. And they're uniquely, they're kind of built different too. They're kind of tall, really long legs. So they have a neat looking bill, a lot of color. And this is a Southwest bird. So you'd see this in Arizona, which sounds weird, huh? And also like in the um, South East. So like Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, those kind of places. So another reason to love ducks. So duck conservation in the last 50 years has been really quite successful. Duck numbers are coming back towards historical numbers in almost all cases, with the exception of the Northern Pintel, which is still in decline. And that one's kind of cause for concern because researchers are doing pretty much everything they can, really throwing everything at it, and they're still coming up declining. But, Overall, ducks are doing really, really tremendous. It's been one of the success stories of conservation in North America. And that has led to, with other things, uh, success in conservation story number two with the return of bald eagles to a lot of their historical range where they were extirpated, you know, during the cause of DDT and things like that. Well, in the wintertime, bald eagles, one of their favorite food is ducks. And we have in the lower 48, lots of wintering ducks, you know, millions. 
And so that has a lot of food sources for bald eagles. So a lot of people think bald eagles eat fish. Well, they do eat fish, but in the wintertime, they really heavily supplement it with ducks. And you can see this one's eating the male ruddy duck, one of the smaller diving ducks. Well, diving ducks, like I said earlier, for them to fly, they need to get a running start. Well, that gives the bald eagle an advantage compared to trying to catch a mallard that can just jump right out of the water and be flying. So those little um, running start ducks, all the divers, tend to get picked off a little bit more. If you've been at, um, let's see, Spring Lake recently, there's a bald eagle that's been there for about a month. And he's been seen numerous times catching coots. And they're kind of the same thing. They're not a waterfowl, but they do need to get running to get going too. And they're kind of slow. So what these ducks do though, this ready duck and what the other diver ducks do, if they are being predated by a bald eagle, when the bald eagle makes a swoop at them, the whole flock, or if it's a flock or if it's an individual, they all dive underwater. And then they'll come up, you know, somewhere else. And then as soon as they come up, they start swiveling their head around trying to reposition where that bald eagle is. And bald eagles are keen on this and they'll keep doing it. And they eventually one of them, either the bald eagle or the flock of ducks tire out and the duck tires out. Well, then it doesn't make a successful dive and the bald eagle gets it. And if the bald eagle tires out, well, then he just gives up and goes, sits in a tree, waits to steal, steal something from an osprey. So looks like we're kind of getting near the end. Got to do some photo credits. My wife and Tom Reynolds are really big help. And Allison, is there anything else I could help? I Thank you so much, Dave. That was great. And that was actually one of the questions is who are these, were those all your photos? So that is great. Um, so they were either mine or Tom's or my wife, Christine's. Great. Wow. Yeah. That there was a lot of compliments on the photos and um, how they showcase the birds behavior and personality. So that was great. Um, and there are some more questions coming into the chat. Um, and there was more that I had, so I'll be watching, but feel free to add questions. We'll see how many we can get through here. Um, let's see, someone asked way back in the chat, someone said, I've noticed that Northern shovelers also seem to go in circles when they're in a big group. Is that because, is, are they doing that same thing to try and bring up food from the bottom or is, are they circling in a group for another reason? Oh, so that's a good question. And it's also a really good observation. So yeah, they'll do it, you know, individually, you can see one duck do it, or they'll do it like the in the video a pair, but they'll also do it like sometimes the whole flock will start doing it. And um, it probably has, you know, just like if you were in a swimming pool, and you started to make a whirlpool by yourself, you're successful, but only so much successful. But if you get like five of your friends in the swimming pool to help you make a whirlpool, it's a lot easier and you make a lot more powerful whirlpool. Well, the same with like, if you're a whole flock of ducks doing it, you could make a better, stronger current so you could upwell a lot more, um, you know, things to feed on and from deeper water. That's a good, good observation. Great observation. I know that was, yeah, the circling. That's a great question. Um, they're really the only ducks that do it in North America, at least. Yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting behavior and an interesting strategy. Um, so more questions. One question that's been asked a couple times is, who do mallards hybridize with? Is it a lot of species? Um, is there a specific species that's common? Um, so hybridization is definitely interesting and expanding. So, so it's a deeper question than it sounds like. So mallards, um, they hybridize with like green wing teal, with um, northern shovelers, trying to, sometimes occasionally, rarely with um, northern pintail. There's been mallard and widgeon crosses 
trying to think. Um, I mean, so quite a few, like at least like five other different puddle ducks that they'll hybridize with. It seems like hybridization is taking place on a larger scale. Um, not sure why. I mean, if someone really started researching it, we'd probably find out it has something to do with humanity. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, that is, there's so many questions coming into the chat. So Good to hear. I'll try and get through some of these. Another one that's been echoed is, is there a good time to go and look at waterfowl, a better time of the day? Yeah. So crepuscular, right? Sunrise and sunset. Um, the ducks are really active at sunrise and sunset. So you have to get up early or stay out late. The middle of the day, the ducks tend to loaf or sleep. So that's where you'll find them just like sitting somewhere kind of preening, not doing a whole lot, but they're really active and they'll start flying around and they'll start talking and making noise early morning and late in the afternoon. And more so if it's a wintry day like today, because you know this is ducky weather, they, they don't mind the rain. And they tend to be more active in the middle of the day when it's overcast and rainy, as compared to like, if it's a sunny day, they'd rather just hang out and sleep. Yeah, right, that makes sense. So classic early morning hours, late evening hours. Um, yeah. And we, you've highlighted some good spots in Sonoma County to see some of these species right now. Um, and some of these species are here now, but they will take off again come probably not too long from now. So could you remind us of some of the, your favorite birding hotspots that you mentioned and also give an estimate of when these waterfowl start to migrate back north? So, okay, yeah. So like some of my favorite local close places to go would be Spring Lake or I like the Jenner Estuary. Russian River Estuary, um, Sonoma Napa Marshes. You can, there's public access to different spots of that. Um, on a wider scale, it's a great time right now to go like to Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge or Calusa National Wildlife Refuge, Delavan, all of those in the Sacramento Valley. They all have really neat numbers. Hunting season's over, so the ducks are gonna be more relaxed. So you'll have a better visitation, I would think. Um, even at a larger scale, if you wanna take a drive um, from Sonoma County, go to the Oregon border, the Klamath Falls, the Klamath Basin. That's, um, as long as it's not frozen over, traditionally, like probably one of the better places on the Pacific Flyway. It's been suffering a little bit because of um, water allocation, um, has been seems like the ducks get it last right now so that doesn't work out well for the refugees up there and which means it doesn't work out well for the ducks up there so they've been bypassing that stop and going further south um but if they get back to getting their water it'd be tremendous it's a tremendous place to go yes oh, and they're going to start leaving so actually we Puxatani Phil said we're going to have six more weeks of winter. If, <laughs> um, and now today here, all of a sudden, we're getting a really good rain. If it started to sun up and stay dry, the birds will start moving. They are really weather dependent and the amount of sunlight during the day, like so the total amount of sun day, like and that kind of starts them moving north. They don't want to go too soon because if you get a freak storm or even just a harsh spring storm, farther north then that could be detrimental to their nesting but they are like if you notice like we do get so what back to the Canada geese so we have the residents here right but we also still get migrants and even our resident geese once their breeding season's over in fall they kind of just make this big flock and they're not really paying attention to males or females so much but now they're all starting to pair up so if you had started studying in early fall a flock of Canada geese, maybe you had a resident pair on your golf, um, not pair of flock, on your golf course, and you started watching them in like September and October and November, it would just be like just one big group of geese and it wouldn't be really, they wouldn't be temperamental, they'd just be walking around. 
Well, now if you started noticing them, they'd all be paired off and they'd be pretty territorial. And if a gander was with his girl goose, and another gander came by, he'd get really upset and like he'd push his wings out and he'd hold his neck out and start biting at him. So all the geese are pairing up right now. And some of the ducks are too. Ah, I see. Okay. So starting some of that breeding behavior. Um, yeah. yeah. And I can just echo that I love the Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge is an amazing place to go and see waterfowl and to really practice those identification skills. If you are you know, around this area in general, that is an amazing, amazing place to go. Um, and this, what you mentioned about the water allocation ties into some other questions. So drought affects how water is distributed in our area. How else does drought affect waterfowl that you've noticed or your observation? So it, um affects their breeding in that less water available. So a great portion of the waterfowl in North America breed in a particular area called the prairie pothole region, which like North Dakota, South Dakota, and then extending into that same area north into Canada. And But it's a wide, you know, it's a huge thousands of mile area. And it's scattered and littered with potholes of water. And in drought years, there's less water. So that means there's less breeding habitat available for the ducks. So ducks, they aren't as widespread spread and, and, and able to breed, but then they're also more highly concentrated. So if you're taking 10 nests per square mile, and all of a sudden you have 100 nests per square mile, that makes it a lot easier for predators because they can key in on behavior patterns and start noticing higher concentrations of ducks. And then that triggers, you know, the predator instinct, there must be something going on over here. I need to pay attention. So it just makes the nest very much less successful. Got it. Yeah. So drought affects also that breeding behavior, which is critical and yeah. Yeah, it seems like that is the direction we are headed in. So we'll see, you know, take some observations of your local, you know, lakes and bays um, and see if you notice any differences between, you know, as it seems we are headed into another drought year here in California. Let's see, I'm looking through here for these, got a couple minutes for some last questions before I close this out. What area, this is a question for the local folks, what area is the eagle hanging out in around Spring Lake? Okay, so for me, my favorite place to go to look for them is to go on the, um, what I think would be the east side of Spring Lake in between Spring Lake and the Swimming Lagoon. And then look back towards the west side of the lake and there's an island on the south end and looked um, towards the redwood trees on that island. And the eagle might not be there when you're looking, but it will fly into those trees, you know, eventually, because it could be, there's, it has a couple different perch spots and then it does leave the lake once in a while. So if you're not seeing it, if you keep looking at those redwood trees, it'll show up. And the best time to go is like, you know, sunrise till about 10 or 11 in the morning. Great. Yeah, that eagle is really a celebrity. It's come up in a couple of our other presentations during this series. So I think there's people across the country that have heard about this bald eagle at Spring Lake. Um, it's pretty crazy. So if you're in the bald <laughs> eagles, another place to go to see them and where you have a really good chance of seeing them is the mouth of the Russian River. So right on Highway 1, there's an overlook north of the town of Jenner, a big wide pullout, dirt pullout. And it overlooks the mouth of the Russian River. And the bald eagles are pretty much there, I want to say every morning, but of course, you know, you could go one morning and they might not be there, but you have to be there like right at sunrise. And because by like eight or nine o'clock, depending on human activity, they'll leave, but they like the beach in the morning. Gotcha. And right now it's a good time because the steelhead are starting to come in when the river's open. And so that means there's food for them to get. 
Great. So some folks are wondering about swans. Um, in this, are there swans that we get here in Sonoma County? So yeah, I didn't really cover swans because we just see so few of them. So mm. the native swan that we would see here are tundra swans. They used to be called whistling swans. And then, you know, of course, they're really big, they're huge, and they're white. Um, so we don't see, a, and they have a big black bill, but we don't see a lot of them. Sometimes you'll see them coastally. Um, they've even come down to Jenner um, once in a while, the Garcia wetlands, um, you know, more up by the Stornetta lands in, in uh, Mendocino County, you'll see a pair or two. Um, so the swans that most people see around here are an invasive species. They're called a mute swan. They're not native. And they're really like spreading out like um, like hordes of locusts. They're just all over the entirety of San Francisco Bay. You could see them like down in San Jose. You could see them over by Oakland. You know, sometimes there's big groups. I think I counted a hundred one time. You could see them in Sassoon Marsh, you know, Grizzly Island. And that's another place you can go to look for waterfowls, Grizzly Island, which is closer. Not quite the drive, but um, so the, the swan most people see around here are unfortunately mute swans. Right, yeah, that's what we see pretty often um, over at Howarth Park, Lake Ralphine. Um, yep. If anyone's wondering if you walk there frequently, yes, those are mute swans. Um, yep, oh, yeah. yep, someone's mentioning it now. <laughs> There's a pair of mute swans at Spring Lake and Lake Ralphine, yes. Yep, there are. Mm -hmm. All right, and then just a quick question. What's the name of the beach at the Russian River mouth? Um, so that would be if you're going to go on the beach ocean part, you would go to Goat Rock State Beach. Got it. Okay, and that was like, that's a good spot to see bald eagles. Um, as well as plenty of other things. It's always, it's an active place and there's all kinds of great natural history notes usually lots of activity going on in that general area, which is why yeah. the bald eagles are there too, so. If you're into goals, it's also a really good beach to go for goal studies, because lots of goals go there after winter. Oh, yeah, wow. Good to have a place to just sit and be able to observe. Yeah. <laughs> um, practice, that goal identification can be challenging, to yeah. say the least. Well, Dave, thank you so much for sharing all you know about waterfowl and taking us on a tour of the waterfowl that we can see here in the Laguna watershed in Sonoma County along the Pacific Flyway. I wanted to note that a lot of these species are, you know, they are birds of the Pacific Flyway and you can see a lot of these species likely in your local bodies of water, your lakes, your bays, um, ponds, if you live within the Pacific Flyway. So please feel free to share this information with others and get out there to observe. This will be recorded. Um, I will send you the recording in a follow-up email tomorrow. So please look for that. And you can also check our YouTube channel and it will be available there as well. Um, I just want to thank you all for participating in this webinar and for participating in this series. It really has been such a joy to hear your stories and your enthusiasm for birds. It's really heartwarming for me to hear and for us at the Laguna Foundation, since birds really are a cornerstone, a cornerstone of our work here. Um, they're a part of why we are designated as a wetland of international importance. We were designated as a wetland of international importance a decade ago, and so we're celebrating that milestone and being here this evening to learn about the waterfowl that make this place special is a part of that celebration. If you would like to support our work, to support our conservation and restoration work, you can visit our website and donate securely through Network for Good um, and help us continue that critical conservation and restoration work that supports the waterfowl that live here in the Laguna. Thank you all, it's been really lovely. And thank you, Dave, for being here with us this evening and sharing all you know. Um, again, I loved all the amazing facts that you dropped through that presentation. I learned a lot. Um, well, thank you, Allison, and thank you, Laguna Foundation, for 
being a nice nonprofit that actually cares about planet Earth and wants to connect people with the Earth and make it better. Yes, that is our goal. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I'll drop this link in the chat and look for that follow up email um, and have a good evening. Bye, Bye folks.